Father, we have been so blessed, we may not even realize how much, that we've got access to you because we've got access to the word that comes from you. It's not just letters and thoughts and ideas that people have put together about you. It is what you have said about yourself, what you have revealed so that we can know you, and that's amazing. Father, may we not miss this encounter, this engagement. And Father, I pray that it would be a supernatural one. And what I mean is that not just the interaction of, of my thoughts with the thoughts of those who hear my thoughts, not my words, with the consideration and application of those listening alone, but Father, that we would hear from you. That we'd be so captured as we listen to your word that we say, wow, God, you're speaking to me. You're speaking you're speaking straight to me and be amazed by that. Father, may, may we never, ever take for granted the incredible gift of, of our salvation, what that really looks like and what the impact of that gift is. May we celebrate all the time. And today, I just pray that you cause my words to be clear, your words to be most prominent, and Father, you would, uh, you would light a fire in us as a result. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the years, one of the more interesting questions that people have asked me has to do with Scripture itself, and, and I get people ask me every now and then this, this question or something to this effect. Why do, you, why do you bother teaching the Old Testament? I mean, we're New Testament people, right? We're under a new covenant. You know, just, just give me the Gospels. Give me what Jesus said. You know, I want to I learn things like, you know, what Paul wrote or Peter or James or John. I mean, I, we're past all that, right? We're not under that anymore. That's the old system, the old covenant. There's nothing there for me anymore. Well, when I say that to you, some of you may respond this way. Well, wait, hold up. If you take away the Old Testament out of the mix, you're going to lose so many, you're going to lose so many good stories. I mean, so many good character studies, so many good examples, you know, that we can apply to our lives today, like how to fight the giants, how to cross the rivers of our life, how to, how to deal with sickness. And Well, no, that's really not the reason either. The reason we preserve the Old Testament is, one, Jesus frequently quoted it himself. He frequently referenced the Old Testament as the basis of scriptural truth, the basis of what God's revealed. And interestingly enough, in our study of Romans, when Paul goes to the scriptures to prove out what he's saying, where does he go? He goes to the Old Testament text. Because in those Old Testaments, we see not an irrelevant, irrelevant part of what God has said or done in the past, but an absolutely essential part of where the gospel begins and how the gospel finds its completion and fulfillment in Christ and will have its ultimate conclusion at the end of all time. But it starts in Genesis. In fact, some of the very things that we think we know about the Old Testament that we find difficult to apply to New Testament times are actually proofs of the New Testament. For instance, people ask sometimes, well, how did people, how did people get saved in the Old Testament? Okay, tell me that. So before Jesus, before there's any message of the kingdom, before there is any perfect life, before there's any sacrificial death, before there's any bodily resurrection. Okay, what happened to those people in Old Testament times? How did they become saved? How did they get right with God? How do we know that they're in heaven? What about Moses? What about Abraham? What about David or Elijah or Elisha or Samuel or the whole list goes on? How, how did they get there? And sometimes we draw, unfortunately, wrong conclusions. We say maybe it was because they were good. Or, or maybe because they knew Jesus was coming, and so they, they thank God that Jesus was coming, and so because of that, they, they were saved. Well, what if they weren't so clear about the coming of Jesus? What about if they weren't so clear about the coming gospel? How then were they saved? Well, the answer is a short one. I'll give you a hint. It's the same means of salvation for us today. The answer is the same. It's still the same gospel from Old Testament and New Testament. And the word that we're looking for is justification. Okay, so justification is this. It's when God treats us as if we were Jesus. When God treats us like we were Jesus, in other words, when God doesn't judge us as we deserve for our sins, but God instead rewards us as if we were perfect like Christ. So how do we get that? Well, another important technological, or not, not theological, I should say, term is imputation. God imputes to us. He puts in our account what belongs in the account of Jesus. So all of his perfections are put in the account of all of us imperfect people. And all of our sinful imperfection is put in the account of him who died for all of those sins for us. And so because of that, we are justified. And that justification, how do you get it? You go to church long enough, you finally achieve it. Say the right words, like a magic formula, and you open up the box and it's granted to you. 
You get baptized and then it's conferred on you. No, no. It's by faith. It's by believing what God has promised and staking your life on it. And interestingly enough, that's the exact way people were saved in the Old Testament as well. By putting their faith in the promises of God, the one who justifies, and so that when the promised one, Jesus, comes, he in fact dies for the sins of all those who came before him and had faith in God, and dies for the sins of all those who after him have faith in God. And Jesus takes the sins of the world on himself. And so that's what Paul was talking about in the passage we looked at just last week. The justice of God is shown in the cross of Jesus. He didn't simply let sin slip for a period of time until Jesus. No, he punished them in Jesus. And he also didn't, he didn't simply leave people in their sins before Jesus, but he rewards them eternally in Christ. And so the word is justification. So if you got your Bible, open up this morning to Romans chapter 4. If you don't have one, I believe you'll find it in the Pew Bibles on page 941. There's your helpful hint for today. And you're going to need it today because we're going to cover a wide swath of Scripture, and I'm not going to have them all on the screen and may not read every one of them, but you'll want to be able to reference back and see exactly what we're talking about. But before we begin, I want to point your attention like two bookends. I'm going to give you one at the beginning and one at the end that frame this out so beautifully and so powerfully for me, and I hope for you too. Such a powerful statement, that alone, this one phrase, okay, and I, I don't want to... I don't want to seem like I'm overhyping this, but there's no way I can overstate this. Okay, there's no way. There's no way I could build this up too much. There's one phrase of Scripture that by itself is enough fuel for everlasting worship. This one phrase by itself is enough to fuel your engagement with God and worship Him gratefully forever and ever. That's how important this statement is. We find it in Romans chapter 4 in verse 5. Where the scripture tells us this, God justifies the ungodly. If you have a different version, maybe it's NIV, for instance. I believe the word in there is the wicked. God himself justifies the wicked. Now think about what he's saying here. This is, this is life-altering, mind-bending stuff. The God of the universe, the God who is perfect in holiness, The God who is utterly without sin or darkness or anything evil in him. The God who is perfect good and perfect light. The God who is truth personified. Here is God himself. And God takes people who are the opposite of that. He takes wicked people. He takes rebellious people. He takes unbelieving people until they believe. He takes corrupt people. He takes broken people. He takes people of all different shapes and sizes and all different manners of failure against him. And he makes them righteous. God does this. Now, how God does this, how God does that great act of mercy, that great act of grace to take ungodly people and make them as if they were godly in his sight, righteous before him, how God does that is what we call the gospel. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And all of Scripture is about that essential good news, how God himself, for himself, by himself, takes people like me and you and makes them right with himself. That's the good news of the gospel, and that's what we're talking about here. That's what we call justification, that God makes us right before him. So let's talk about that today. I'm going to give you some truths. I'm going to build this message this way. I'm going to lay down some important foundation blocks, theological building blocks. These are the things that we need to know and understand, that we need to be rooted in and, and convinced of. And then hopefully I'll share, and you'll pick up some things through along the way, some very specific practical sort of applications because those things are true. So let's start with those five building blocks here in Romans chapter 4 that we can learn about justification. Okay, the first one is this. We know when it comes to being made right with God or justified, Abraham was not justified. Contrary to what most Jews then and now think, Abraham was not justified by works. He was not justified by works. He did not earn this. If you were to ask a, a modern religious Jew, or one in Paul's day, they probably would say, wait a minute, Paul, okay, all this stuff that you're talking about, that Paul, not this one, he says, all this stuff you're talking about, the universality of sin, everybody has sinned, all have fallen short, even worse than that, not only have all sinned, but all have actively rebelled against God. No one seeks after God, no one, not anybody, Romans chapter 2. Whether they're religious, Romans chapter 2, irreligious, pagan, Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 3, they all have the same condition, all have fallen short of the glory of God. Okay, The Jewish audience of Paul's day and even today might say, but time out. That's not true. Because Scripture itself tells us of a righteous one, Abraham. 
Abraham is an example. He is the father of us all. He's the father of our faith. He's the one that God gave the covenant of our promise to. He's the one that we all count ourselves of as, son, as sons and daughters of. And God rewarded him. God justified him because he was good, because he was righteous, because he did what God wanted him to do. And to their counter-argument, Paul actually teaches the exact opposite. He said, the very person that you look up to the most, both then and now for a Jewish person, the very person you look up to the most the person that you would say is the epitome of the friend of God, the friend of God, the one who was righteous and good and obedient and so faithful to God. Surely, surely he, he earns God, right? Now listen, the point here is pretty obvious if you haven't made the connection already. If Abraham is not sufficiently righteous on his own to stand before God confident that God's going to allow him into everlasting heaven, why in the world would anyone else be? Why in the world could anyone else be? Abraham was not saved by works. Scripture makes it very, very clear. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. I mean, if Abraham was justified by works, he would rightly be proud. He would be able to say, I earned this. I did this. I made it. When he gets to heaven, it would be like crossing the finish line as a winner of a marathon. No one gave you that medal. No one said, you know, look, you, you, I know you don't deserve it. In fact, you don't run at all. But here's a medal. You're the winner. No, I earned this. I trained hard. I worked hard. I did my part. Here I am. Give me my medal. Give me what I deserve. He'd have something to boast about. But how does any man, and that's what he means, but not before God, how does any man, how do any of us stand before perfection and holiness and say, I did it. Look at me. So he says, not Abraham either. Look at verse 3. For what does the Scripture say? What does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. It's an important sub-point I want to make here for a moment. It's obvious that Paul is countering a popular argument. Abraham achieved right standing with God because Abraham did what Abraham was supposed to do. He was the representative of human goodness. I mean, he did it. That's what we feel. That's what we think. Our, our lives are based on this false conviction. To that, Paul says, but what do the Scriptures say? Now, this is, this is hugely important. Paul could have phrased that different ways if he had wanted to. He could have said, what do you find written? What did the prophets say? What does the law Say, he said, what did the Scripture say? And this may seem like a minor point for those of you who already hold Scripture in high view and high authority. The point he's making very clear is this. The Scriptures have the authority to speak rightly for God himself. We can look to what the Scriptures say and know with certainty that what they say is what God has said. So when he makes an appeal on a personal level, what do the Scriptures say? He's speaking of the Scriptures as if they themselves have life. They themselves have power. They themselves have inherent authority. It's the basis that guides us. Now, why is that important? Why is that important? Well, I can promise you this. There'll scarcely be a person in this room that won't be challenged at some very personal point of faith or prior belief or emotion at something you're going to hear and learn that Romans teaches. You're going to hear something of somewhere, if it hasn't hit you already, from chapter 1 to chapter 9, something is going to hit you at some point, point. you're going to say, well, well, hold up. I don't know how I feel about that. I don't know what I think about that. Well, I've always heard people say this. And you're going to have a tendency to, to go to what makes sense to you. You're going to have a tendency to fall back on something that's been commonplace to you. You're going to have a tendency to turn to a favorite teacher and say, but so-and-so always says this. And the challenge at that moment is going to be the same thing it has always been. But what do the Scriptures say? What do the Scriptures say? Because we build our theology on no man, nor on any system. We build our theology on what do the Scriptures say? 
And as God's people, we have to be willing to say, you know what, if the Scriptures clearly say something that is different than what I have heard, then I have to discard what I've heard and embrace what the Scriptures have said. If the Scriptures say something that's different than what I want them to say or feel like they should say, I've got to discard personal preference and emotion for what the Scriptures actually say. And if the Scriptures say something different than my favorite preacher growing up said, then I've got to be willing to discard my favorite preacher's teaching on that passage, not my favorite preacher, because we're all fallible, but the Scriptures are not. They're infallible and embrace what the Scriptures say. So he takes him, he said, but what do the Scriptures really say about Abraham? He believed. And when he believed in God, God took off of his account his unrighteousness and placed into his account righteousness, and God counted it. God counted it. And then he says, and to the one who does... Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David speaks, look at verse 7. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. He's talking about blessed is the justified man. So here's some things that we know. We've got to pick up the pace a little bit to get through. One, we know this. Salvation is not a wage that we earn. Would you agree with that statement? Salvation is not a wage that we earn. In other words, there will never be a person who will stand before God and God will say, awesome, great job, you did it, here's what you have earned. None. While Scripture makes it clear that salvation is not a wage to be earned, do you remember what Scripture is equally clear is a wage to be earned? Sin is a wage to be earned. The wage that we have earned The payment that is due us is actually our sin. So for us to have some sort of notion that, okay, I know I've been a sinner, but I've also been a good person. And and I know my good exceeds my my bad, so one will negate the other. So let's just say hypothetically, I got a thousand sins I'm aware of, but at least a thousand and one good things. Won't I have a net score of plus one? And won't that be good when I stand before God? No, it doesn't work that way. Because goodness is not a wage. Goodness is a gift. Righteousness is a gift. And the only way to pay the wage is with the righteousness of Christ. So salvation is a gift that we receive, not a wage that we earn. Now, I put in your notes or in mine a little asterisk beside the word justification. A lot of good definitions have been given by a lot of people smarter, more biblically knowledgeable than I am. So I don't want to try to come up with a new definition that's different than you've ever heard, nor do I want to try to choose one among the pantheon of definitions offered. Instead, I want to give you what I think is the clearest biblical definition of what justification is. You find its essence in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 sums up justification. In fact, you sang about it or heard it sung about this morning already. Here's justification. For our sake, he, that's God, made him, that's Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, Jesus, we, that's me and you, might become the righteousness of God. For our sake, he made him who knew no sin, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's imputation. That's the great exchange. All that I am that deserves a payment for those sins, for all that Christ is in exchange for that, justification. Number two, let's keep rolling. Abraham also, contrary to what a lot of Jews would think today, Abraham was not justified by circumcision. He said, okay, if it wasn't wasn't works that justified him, then it was that mark of God that says he's in God's covenant. You know that mark, that mark that it finds all the Jews that Paul had been talking to in that day. That, That one mark that made them feel unique among all the peoples of the earth, the one mark that they used as a slanderous accusation against anyone who didn't have it. So we read some of those early New Testament scriptures, and we talk about the uncircumcised, and we think, well, that, that's just like a medical thing, right? That's just personal preference today. We don't make any big deal of that. But for the religious Jews to accuse someone of being an uncircumcised person, what they're accusing them of is being a moral or spiritual barbarian, far from God, out from under God's covenant, God's family. Okay, these are, these are the pagans, the uncircumcised. And so a Jewish person, both then and now, would say, okay, so here's why he was Here's why he's saved. He was circumcised. That circumcision marks him as one of God's. It puts him into the covenant relationship, and that's the basis of his standing before God. Can you possibly think of any modern religious spiritual application that we might also misapply as a basis for our confidence in standing before God? How about baptism? 
And, and I'll bet more than a few of you have, have had the wall of baptism thrown up in your face when you're trying to share with someone their need for forgiveness their condition before God as an unforgiven person, their need to put their faith and trust in Christ. And, and you'll hear this response, oh, man, I've been baptized. I'm good. Now, that baptism may have taken place when they were seven or eight. It may have taken place when they were far younger than that. And in their minds, now they're marked. They're done. They're good. They're covered. It's over with. But Scripture teaches that that's not the case. That's not the case. It wasn't the case then. It's not the case now. It wasn't the case in circumcision. It's not in baptism. Listen to what he says. Is this blessing, what's the blessing? Justification. Is it only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. So, so in other words, wait, can uncircumcised people, non-Jewish people, every person, can they also receive justification? Because we've already said it was not by works, it was by faith. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he'd been circumcised? So the question now is this, when was Abraham justified? Was it when he got circumcised or was it before that? Well, Scripture makes it very clear. It was not after, but it was before he was circumcised. I have to, I have to give myself a time out here because this is an important aside. When we talk about justification, when does a person get justified? When are you made right with God? It's an important question. When are you justified? Are you justified when you finally stand before the throne of God in judgment and God accepts you into his heaven? Or has it happened before that? I know you had some questions. We, we had some questions. We were talking about sin on Wednesday night, the doctrine of sin. What happens to someone who dies and they haven't confessed sin? We know the answer to that question, right? Were they justified? Were they justified? Because for those of you who are in Christ today, for those of you who have received the gift of salvation, you are justified you know that? Now, you're not fully sanctified. That's not just a religious term. You're not fully like Christ. You've got a ways to go as I do. But in the eyes of God, you have been made righteous. How do you know this? Because he has granted to you, he's imputed to you Christ's righteousness. That's what happens at faith. And so let's look at Abraham's example. Abraham was already granted righteousness because of faith, and the circumcision act was his obedience in response to the relationship that he already had. And that's why when the Scripture goes on to say this, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So he had it. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. Now track with me. I don't want you to get confused. This is where the high weeds of Romans 4 start to crop up. The Romans, I'm sorry, the Jews in Paul's day, here's what they believed. Even when they accepted the gospel, Okay, even when these Jews became converted and accept Jesus as Messiah, they still struggle with the notion of circumcision, right? So they had this debate in early church council. What do we do with these new pagans that are coming to Jesus? They've confessed sins, they've repented of sins, they've turned to Christ, they've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now do they also have to be circumcised, right? That was the debate, wasn't it? And what did the early church decide? And rightly so, in the leadership of the Holy Spirit. No, it's not necessary. So that's totally counteracted what the Jews thought, right? So the Jews thought, okay, to be part of God's family, you've got to be circumcised. Because in the Old Testament, you could convert and you could become part of the Jewish family if you were circumcised. But what they didn't understand was that was a foreshadowing. That was a, a symbol of something much bigger and richer, that Jesus is the fulfillment of that covenant, that Jesus makes us right with Christ, that he is our circumcision. And so the answer is this, how could Abraham be said in Genesis that he's going to be the father of many and many nations if the expectation of all of those many nations was to be circumcised. It can't be. That's not the answer. The answer is faith. So you've got this equation. Both justification and circumcision were gifts of God. They're gifts. Baptism is a gift. Baptism is a special and unique gift where God's presence is uniquely felt and experienced and displayed where his glory is shown to those who are baptized. But baptism, apart from saving faith, is worthless. It's meaningless. So which was given first, justification or the gift of circumcision, the gift of justification? I use this illustration with kids sometimes. It's probably not the best. I'm sure there are better ones and theologians better than, than I am who probably come up with them. But it, it, it works with a kid's understanding. I get a young person to come in and, and want to be baptized, and, 
And I'll ask them what they understand about salvation, what they understand baptism to mean. And frequently I'll say something like this. I said, I said, you see this ring that I wear? I said, you know what this is, what this is for? And almost universally they get this. Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's a wedding ring. I said, you know, it's not particularly valuable materially. I mean, it, it's, it's not even my first wedding ring. It's like the third or fourth one. I got this one in Mexico. It cost me $30. Um, but it has worth to me. And I said, you know what, if I gave you this ring today and you started wearing it, would it have the same meaning and worth to you? I mean, if you just put this ring on, would you suddenly be in a lifelong committed relationship, a covenant relationship with my wife because you're wearing my ring? Would, it, would this suddenly create a, a loving, lifelong, committed relationship, a covenant with another person just because you're wearing this ring? No, of course not. You'd be wearing a piece of cheap Mexican jewelry. But for me, it's a symbol of the covenant and the relationship that already exists in the same way as baptism. If you were baptized as an infant, if you were baptized as a very small child, not of your own choice or understanding, if you even look back at your own baptism and say, with all honesty, I didn't know what I was doing then. I didn't know what that was for. I have no idea what that was about. What is the worth of the thing? None. A baptism is a seal, a mark, an external mark of an internal reality, a relationship that exists. Because I love Christ, I'm going to be baptized. Why were they circumcised? Because they were obedient. They are obedient to the command. Why are we baptized? Because we're obedient to the command, and we don't mind being marked by, by Christ. Let's keep rolling. Number three, Abraham was not justified also by the law. He was not justified by the law. In other words, it wasn't because he kept the commandments. It wasn't because of personal righteousness. It wasn't because he was such a good man. I mean, we could look back and say, relatively speaking, Abraham was a, he was a high watermark of, of, of goodness. But perfect? I mean, come on. Any of you who've studied Abraham's life know there were some, some low water marks as well, right? I mean, this is, this is the same guy who defied God's plan for him and went in with his wife's maidservant to have a child. This is the same guy who let his wife be taken into a, um, a Pharaoh's harem in Egypt. I mean, there are a lot of missteps in Abraham's life. This is, a, this is the same guy who disobeyed the intent of God and went down and planted his tents near Sodom and Gomorrah only for those heinous places to suck in his nephew Lot and their family and end up destroying his, his niece. I mean, there are many missteps here. That was not perfection. Romans 4, verse 13 tells us his righteousness, the promise, didn't come through the law. Why? Verse 15 answers that. For the law brings wrath. The law points out our shortcomings. And the best any of us can do when it comes to the law, if the law is the way we think we're going to get right with God or the law is the way we think we're going to get access to God, if we think we're going to stand before God and say, I have been good, I've kept your laws, the best any of us can hope for is to be close. That's it. I mean, that's, that's all you can hope for. The best any of us can hope for is, is that you're better than the rest of us, but you're still condemned with the rest of us because all fall short of the glory of God, all far, fall short of the glorious standard. So we know it's not the law. Again, that's what it says. For if it is, verse 14, if it is the adherence, adherence of the faith who are to be the heirs, faith is null in the promise, I mean, I'm sorry, if it is the adherence of the law who are to be made heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. That's why it depends on faith, verse 16, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Now listen, you can read the rest of that passage. What he's saying here, how could God have made a promise to Abraham, reiterated several times, again in Genesis chapter 12, how does God make a promise to Abraham? You're going to be the father of many nations. Many are going to be through your lineage. And how can he make a covenant promise to them that they're going to be part of his everlasting family? if the promise he's making is contingent upon all of those people being good enough to make it. It's impossible. It would be like God saying to Abraham, okay, I'm laying you into heaven because you've been good enough, and I'm going to promise not only you're going to be good enough, but he is, and she is, and they are, and she will be, and they will be. No, God is not making a promise that impacts all of eternity based on how good some of us are going to be. He made a promise that impacts all of eternity based on how good he knew Jesus was going to be. And so the promise would be grace, it would be faith in Jesus, so that any person in any generation, in any culture, could put their faith in Jesus who's good enough, and Jesus saves them. Hope of salvation then rests on grace, not goodness. We also know Abraham was, as we've talked about, justified by faith. Abraham was justified by faith. Verse 22 says, his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Okay, so here you have at the beginning, 
God justifies the ungodly. He makes those who are sinful right with him. How does God do that? He answers that in verse 22. Faith counts as righteousness. Now, it's very interesting. How do we know that Abraham had faith? I mean, obviously, Scripture tells us, but what does Scripture tell us is the evidence of Abraham's faith? Well, again and again, you see in Abraham's life, and it's a great life study. Again and again in Abraham's life, you see phrases like this, and God said to Abraham, God told Abraham, the word of the Lord came to Abraham. Abraham had faith in something very specific and concrete. What was it? He had faith in the spoken word of God. He had faith in the spoken word of God. So God spoke to Abraham. Now listen, God spoke to Abraham. Abraham believed what God said with all of his heart, and then he built all of his life around what God had said. Do you see what, what Abraham did? God told him something. Abraham accepted that word as true, believed it with all of his heart, and he took all of his life and he built it around those words. That's what a life of faith looks like. Now, you and I, what what do we have that we could trust in? What do we have that could be a foundation for our faith? If you're waiting for God to speak to you audibly like he did Moses out of a bush, or Abraham when he told him to get up and leave Ur of Chaldees and go to a land I'm going to show you, if you're waiting for this word to come through a a prophet like like Nathan coming talking to King David and said, God told me to tell you, you're going to be waiting a long time. But it doesn't mean you don't have a word from God. It doesn't mean you don't have something that God is still saying to you today, that something is still alive and sharp and powerful that penetrates and speaks to every concern of the heart, reveals to you everything you need to know about God. It doesn't mean you don't have it. What do we have today? We don't have the spoken word. We have the what word? We got the written word. We got the written promises of God. So we talk about Abraham was justified by faith. You have a good definition, a good working definition of what faith is? Again, I could go to some external sources, and a lot of good people have written some good definitions. Let me give you one that you can't go wrong with that's straight out of the Scriptures. Definition of faith is found in Romans 4.21. In Romans 4.21, we see Abraham, who was in the condition of being fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. That's faith. Listen, fully convinced God's able to do what he promised. So I hear what God is saying. I take God's word and I believe it with my whole heart. And in believing that word with my whole heart, I will build my entire life around what it says. What's important to me, the morals that I have, the values that I hold, how I conduct myself in business or in relationships, in family, how I spend my time, the things I care about, I will, because I have believed what God has said, because I'm understanding that word, I'm taking it into my heart, I will build my life on that word. That, that is, is faith. And so just like for Abraham, justification, salvation, for us is still by faith. It's still the same. It's still the same gospel. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So the very case study that works righteousness, religious people try to hold up as an example of contrary to grace. You can earn this. You can do this on your own. He says, no, Abraham is a great example for all of us. Righteousness comes through faith. It was written for all of us. Now, I spent a lot of time on that, but let me hit this last part. It's worth it, so don't look at your watch. I'm going to give you some faith lessons that you and I need to be applying today. If this is what pleases God, if this is what faith is, if this is what faith looks like, then what should we be doing? I'm going to give you four lessons. First one is this. Faith, by its very nature, and faith out of necessity, faith goes, faith goes beyond reason, but faith is not irrational. If you could figure it all out, you wouldn't require faith. If you could see the end from the beginning, faith would be unnecessary. Certainly that was true of Abraham, right? I mean, wasn't that true of Abraham? 
If you knew exactly what God was going to do and how he was going to do it, if you knew this was going to happen and this was going to happen and this was going to happen, where would the faith be? In fact, that was one of Abraham's real issues. We note him, and Hebrews notes him as a pinnacle of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. But often, one of Abraham's most defining sins was he tried to do God's will in his own way. So when God was sending him to do something and it became difficult or challenging, like God sent him into this land of promise and famine came, he didn't stay, he didn't wait it out, trusting in God who sent him there. He instead went down to Egypt. When he went down to Egypt, he almost lost his wife. He lost his testimony, created animosity with the Egyptians for generations to come. I mean, examples like that. So faith does go beyond what we can see, but faith is not irrational. It's not irrational. So we have a real hard time understanding what faith is today, I think. And, and I think a lot of popular Christian preaching and teaching cloudies the issue terribly. Because faith, if you're kind of paying attention, seems to be being taught as some sort of internal force. Some sort of internal something that you can, I can't even define it, you can just sort of muster up. And if you have enough of it, then miraculous things can start to happen. You can speak things into existence that aren't. You can lay claim to things that you don't have. You can speak to your sickness or to your poverty or to this or to your that. If you only muster enough faith, but no one ever really tells you how you get this faith, but you ought to have it. The only way I know for sure how to get it is you can sow a seed against your need for faith, which is usually money. Uh, you see where I'm going with this. Is that viable? Is, is it viable to have that sort of faith? No, faith is only as viable as the object of my faith is reliable. What makes faith not irrational is the confidence we have in the one who's telling us what to do. You see, Abraham, Abraham's faith wasn't in the future of going to the land of promise. Abraham's faith wasn't in the, the promise itself of just, I'm going to be a great nation. Abraham's faith was in the source of those promises. You see what I'm saying? Abraham didn't have faith in like, oh, you painted a beautiful picture of me. I believe I can do it. I can achieve this. I can be the father of a great nation. I can have a great name. I can go into the land of promise. I can do it, and it's going to be wonderful. God, if you say so, I'll believe it. What made Abraham's faith a viable faith is he believed God. The rest of it, I'm sure, seemed, I don't know Abraham's personality, and I don't know the way he communicated with God Though the scripture calls him God's friend, but I had, I had to imagine Abraham has to say sometimes like, if you say so, if you say so. So what about your faith? If you're just trying to conjure up faith for faith's sake and you're misusing faith or the object of faith is yourself or your will or your ability to believe or trust in something, it's not viable. If you say, well, I'm trusting in God and God's going to do these things for me, God's going to prosper me and God's going to heal me or God's going to bless me or God's going to do all these things for me. Where does God say he's going to do those things for you? On what basis? Your, your faith is an idea or a concept. Do you have a written word from God that assures you of these things, that tells you of these things? Is your faith rightly placed? So that's one of the things we do with Scripture, isn't it? Remember I said this. I said, here's what Abraham did. Here's a model of faith. Abraham heard God's word to him. He accepted it, believed it with all of his heart. Because he believed God's word, he built his whole life around it. Even though building his life around it meant that he would have to go places he never would have gone on his own. He would have to do things he never would have chosen to do on his own. He would face and deal with people he never would have dealt with on his own. He'd have pain and hardships he never would have brought on his own. He'd have decisions to make he would have never had to um, realize on his own. All because he built his life around faith. But in the end, he'd be blessed in a way he could never have imagined. So in the same way, we, by faith, choose to accept what God says, and that means our lives are going to be different. And God may send us to places or take us places we never would have chosen to go. He may put us in places we never would have chosen to be. He may put people around us we never would have been around. He may test us in ways we have never chosen to be tested by, but ultimately he'll reward us in ways we never could have imagined if we'll trust him, if we'll believe in him. But what happens if we're believing things that he has not said? And that's one of the great things we do with Scripture, Right? I was kind of laughing to myself when David Platt, Friday night, we were doing Secret Church, and he was talking about how he'd misappropriated a biblical promise. He told the story pretty funny, and I could certainly resonate with it because I did something similar when I was a kid. When I was in middle school, we were playing basketball. One struggle I had, and it probably was just because of anxiety, not because I wasn't practicing at it, but I just got so nervous when I get on the free throw line, I just couldn't shoot free throws. And I almost got to the point where I hated being fouled. It's like, I, I, you know, I'm so nervous, so anxious. And I was a Christian kid, and so I'm, I'm searching the scriptures, and I'm reading, and all of a sudden, God gives me the word. He gives me the scripture for me. Right then and there that day, I got it. This is the verse. I write it on the bottom of my shoe. You might even guess what it is. You probably put it on your desk. You probably applied it to 20 different things inappropriately. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Apparently, that didn't include free throws. 
God's promise of doing all things through Christ who strengthens me is not a promise that we'll be able to shoot free throws better. It's a promise that we can find our satisfaction in him. It's a promise to all the things of this world we don't really need, but what we need is him, and he gives us what we need. But if we try to believe in something God has not said, we're setting ourselves up for disappointment. Faith goes beyond reason, but it's not irrational. It's based on the reliability of the one who promises. Number two, faith without action is not real faith. Let me go quickly because my time is short. Faith without action isn't real faith. In other words, if you say, well, here's what I believe. You know, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I ask Jesus in my heart. Yeah, I've been going to church all my life. If that doesn't alter the way that you live in significant ways, if the application of belief has not caused you to bend your will and your preferences and your priorities and your decisions and your future around what God has said in his word, how can you call that real faith? I mean, I always find it in the most extreme example, I find it ironic that so many people think or would say, I'm trusting God to take care of forever for me. I ask Jesus in my heart, so when I die, I know I'm going to heaven. But you don't trust him enough to do what he says today. You, you don't trust him enough to go against the flow of people today. You don't trust him enough to put this down and take him up today. You don't, you don't trust him enough to live life his way today. You don't trust him enough to deny yourself of what your sinful flesh desires and believe in him today that, that God's got something better for you. I mean, I, real faith is a bending of the will. I mean, what did Abraham do? I mean, there are at least four big marks of his faith, right? I mean, in the beginning, God calls him to leave Ur of the Chaldees, and here's the only thing he told him. I'm going to send you to a place I'll show you later. What? What is that? You pull up your roots, your financial ones and your relational ones, your, your family ones, all your investments of people and time and resources, everything you know, pull it up and get going. Well, where am I going? Uh, just go. I'll show you. What did Abraham do with that? He went. Later on, God defines it. He says, now you're going to go to Canaan or Canaan. You're going to go into this, this new land. And, and if you, when you do this, um, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make your, your offspring like dust of the earth or stars of the sky. If you'll just do this and go, and what does he do? He goes. It gets bigger. Now he goes specifically into that land and that place. Later on, God comes to him. Now Abraham is getting a little long in the tooth. He's 99 years old. Any 99s in here? 90s? 89s? You don't have to admit it. It's, not, it's a badge of honor. 99, he comes to him and says, okay, here's the deal, Abraham. You're going to have a child now. What? Sarah, 90, and she's had no children, and it's not for lack of trying. So here's 99 and 90, and you're going to have a child now. And this child, you know, this is going to be the fulfillment of my promise. And so what happens? He tells Abraham, now is the sign of this covenant I've made with you. Go get circumcised. This is going to be your mark. And Abraham doesn't flinch. 99 years old, circumcised, getting ready to have a kid. You figure it out. And then child comes. He starts to grow. The affection of a father for his son, you can only imagine. We make a big deal sometimes that it, was, that it was his only son that God called him to sacrifice. I'm not sure, honestly, if that matters. I've got three sons. Like, it, if I only had one, if I had three, if I had ten, it would be the same, the same pain. And now here's an old man. Game is over. He's not having more kids. He's that, got that illegitimate one he had outside of God's plan. And here God's telling him, all right, this, this child of promise, this, this answer, to everything I promised you, I want you to go sacrifice him. Now, you, you take the pain of a dad losing his, his own son at his own hand, which is indescribable. And on top of that, you add not only the death of Isaac, but the death of every dream, every hope, the death of your legacy, the le death of your heart, the death of your understanding of God's promise to you. I mean, all is going to go. And it's, I can almost imagine Abraham saying on that day, so here's me and Isaac and the servant, and God, it all dies here. It's all over right here. All of this to end here. And somehow, miraculously enough, Abraham, by faith, went up there ready to do what God said. But some, something about that wasn't because he thought it would end. It's because he still believed God enough that God would do what he has promised. Even in the moment where he was going to sacrifice his son, Abraham was still convinced that God is fully able to do what he's promised. I can't possibly see how you're going to do it now. This is the one, but you've done it before. You gave me a child when I was 100. You've provided for me all these many years and still fully convinced by faith. See, Abraham gets to that day and he obeys because he trusts God. 
Unless there's a lesson just in that by itself. I doubt seriously any of us are ever going to receive a word from God that tells us to do something so extreme. How do you ever even imagine to get to a point like that? You've got to have some sort of track record with God. God, though I don't understand, because that's the essence of faith. It's the substance of things not seen. But I'm fully convinced that you're able to do what you promised, and so I'm going to build my life around it, even if it means this. That's faith. You see, real faith transcends all of our circumstances. Real faith goes beyond. It, it defies the evidence. It flies in the face of what's obvious. It contradicts emotion. It contradicts circumstances. It transcends them. Verse 17, he says, I made you the father of many nations. And then verse 18, in hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he's been told, so shall offspring be. Look at verse 19. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. I love that statement about Abraham. It's kind of, I don't know, kind of humorous to me. Not the sort of complimentary thing we would say today, rather harsh, isn't it? Abraham, he was as good as dead, folks, but he didn't waver. He didn't waver. When the promise to him came of a child, the circumstances said, no way, man, this doesn't even make sense. Your wife's been barren all her life, and now she's 90. You're 99, almost 100. doesn't make sense. In hope, he believed. Against hope. In other words, and against what hope should see. Here, here's, here's what you should be thinking, but no, no, faith transcends that. And your faith has got to do the same. But it seems like this, God. No, no, it's like this, because this is what God has said. And finally, we see this truth in verse 20. Faith that is exercised is faith that grows. And the faith that is growing, that exercised faith that is growing, that faith is the kind of faith that glorifies God. It glorifies God. You can look at verse 20 if you've got your Bible open. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Wow. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, and he grew strong as he gave glory to God. See, that's the answer of how he went from a big step Leave or go to a place I'll show you. Leave everything you know and your people, your family, your friends, everything, go to an impossible step. From a hard step to an impossible step, how do you get there? Because over time, your faith is being exercised. You're doing what God says, even when it's hard. You're obeying God when you don't want to. You're denying yourself of some pleasure or something. You say, but I, I know God just wants me to be happy. No, God wants you to be like Christ Jesus. And as you're exercising faith, Here's what's happening. That faith is getting stronger and stronger. And as that faith gets stronger, what does it do? It gives glory to God. It pleases Him. It reflects Him well. It causes your friends, your neighbors, your family members to say, wow, look at them. Look at their faith. Look at what they've endured. They still believe. And some of you have ex exercised faith in, in, in pain and loss and suffering. It's not just for, for your own sake. It's not just that the exercise that has made you feel better, and, and, and you say sometimes, I don't know how people do this without faith. Well, that, that's true, yes. But imagine this word that it has spoken about God to the people around you. In spite of all this, they have faith. That's what real faith is. So that's the essence of justification. God justifies the ungodly when they'll put their faith in him. When they'll believe what he said, when they'll take him at his word, and they'll build all their life around that for the rest of their life. The building of the life around it is not what earns us the justification. It's the evidence that we've been justified. Would you pray with me this morning?